This episode that you're hearing right now is without a doubt the hardest one that I've ever recorded in my entire, I don't know how long it's been now, like a year and a half or so of me doing this podcast. This has been the hardest episode. And it was hard for for two reasons. So the subjects coming out of that last trip, in fact, the last trip itself in its entirety was so absolutely abstract that it's very incredibly freaking insanely hard to even begin to describe. And my second problem was that the the scope and scale of these topics and and stuff uh, coming out of that trip and the trip itself was so cosmic in scale that it makes it even that much harder to explain. I mean, imagine something incredibly ab- abstract and on scales that uh, go beyond the cosmos, uh, even the multiverse, okay? It's freaking, indi- it's, it's, it's hard, y'all. I, I've, <laughs> this is now like my sixth or, or so uh, rewriting and re-recording of this episode. But I landed on something that I think is good enough. It'll never be perfect because it is impossible to describe what happened. It's, it's, it's freaking impossible. And you'll, you'll hear me say that, like, uh, that's something that I'll repeat like about 30 times in this episode. Hell, you can turn it into a drinking game. Okay. Y'all indescribable stuff, but just like humans have done since the dawn of history, you can extrapolate what's known into the unknown and figure some kind of stuff out. So that's what I did. I did a lot of analogizing, a lot of symbolism, a lot of metaphor. I threw some science in there too. Don't worry about that. And I made something that I think is the best interpretive uh, representation of what happened in these waves of God's true form, these waves of infinity. Okay, Uh, of the six incredibly deep themes that occurred during that trip, that's the one that I decided to to lead with. That's the tip of the spear. I think if you understand or, or, you know, you can't really truly understand it unless you see it yourself. And I know that's a giant cop out. I'm sorry, but... That's the topic that I chose to be the tip of the spear because understanding even a little bit of it will give you a broader and greater understanding of the other five topics that came out of that experience. I feel that's the best way to go forward because all the other topics, the the least common denominator here is God's infinite power. What I want to cover here is God's true form, these waves of infinity that, that I experienced these waves of beyond infinity, okay, that. And because this is such a very incredibly deep and broad topic, this is actually the first time in this podcast's history that I'm going to be doing a two-parter. So first of all, if you haven't listened to the actual trip episode, go do it. A lot of this won't make sense unless you listen to it. And trust me, you'll want to listen to it anyway, because it is quite possibly the deepest thing uh, this is going to sound so egotistical, but I'm sorry. It's it's like the deepest thing that you can possibly imagine in the history of our universe. How about that? But of course, if this is your first time listening to this podcast, period, I'm obliged to, to tell you to start from you know episode one. If you don't want to listen to all the episodes, uh, listen to trip number five, The Answer. But regardless, do some listening before you get here. For anyone who's been here since the beginning definitely listen to part two. You won't have a full understanding of of it. We won't have the least common denominator, like the base knowledge, unless you uh, listen to both parts. And I promise it'll come out soon. I'm not going to wait a month. Um, I think that these uh, unpacking episodes don't need as much time to to work on because it's less editing and such. And also, I just want to crank them out. So I'm going to release it soon. Anyways, I've been talking too much. I love you all. Um, stick around for future unpacking episodes. We have a lot to unpack in these six major topics that spilled out. Okay, so let's jump in with uh, trying to wrap our brains around the concept of God's infinite power. A nice light subject matter to get your day started. Anyways, let's do it. Okay, so it's mid-July 2022. And I'm about halfway through a month-long work trip slash vacation in Europe. 
Uh, tomorrow we're going to, to the plant. We've organized something there. Wednesday we're going to visit a, a client. After about and two weeks of work, my wife and her friend have met up with me in Italy. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, yeah, it's all right. He knows I'm like super excited, right? I'm like, it's, I mean, it's okay, it's okay. And we are enjoying all of the sights. Oh my God. Food. Apparently anchovies are really popular. Yeah. Those look good. And yes, of course, amazing hikes. My wife and I happen to be very fond of hikes. Whoa. So anyway, we're traipsing around Italy, having a ball. When I realized that ever since I left the corporate world, there are no more paid vacation days for me anymore. I had better come out of this personal part of this Europe trip with something productive for my podcast. And this is before I had even sat down to even start editing trip number 10 beyond infinity. So that is what's on the top of my mind. You know, stuff like, what should the opening segment be? What's the hook? Is there any fat that needs to be trimmed out? And I also start thinking even further into the future about what the unpacking episodes would be. And so we're hiking around, we're having a few drinks here and there, and I'm tossing around all these ideas in my head during the day. And right at about dinner time, I remembered and started thinking deeply about the analogy that I made in the Trip 10 interview about God's infinite power being like an atomic bomb detonated next to an ant. Still in deep thought, I got dressed and descended down the amazingly beautiful and quaint city staircase in Conca de Marine, down to the little family-run beachside restaurant. We sat, we got drinks and appetizers, and still entranced in deep thought about the ant analogy, I witnessed something, something amazing. Something that was taking place literally on the table in front of me. Something so small and otherwise unnoticeable that only one other person in the entire restaurant noticed. But something so cosmically significant that understanding the seemingly irrelevant event happening on this table would unlock a full understanding of not only our reality, but the reality beyond our universe and beyond the multiverse as well. But we'll get back to that story a little bit later. For now, we're going to talk about what was in those waves of God's true form that I encountered on my last trip. What was infinity like? But first here, let me start off by saying that we will never fully understand infinity, ever. So long as we have this uh, flesh and blood um, body <laughs> on in this uh, plane of existence... We will never truly and fully understand infinity. It's impossible. And so that begs the question, if I'm so confident that I saw infinity and yet human beings will never fully understand that, you know, what infinity is, how in the heck am I so confident that I saw it? And in order for us to even start that discussion, we need to first talk about what I didn't see, okay, what uh, infinity isn't. So if I asked you to close your eyes right now and imagine infinity, what would you see? I think most people would close their eyes and imagine the cosmos. I mean, we usually think about space when we think about infinity, right? And rightfully so. I mean, that's where all discussions kind of point towards uh, most of the time, right? I think others of you would close your eyes and you would imagine just infinite blackness uh, surrounding you, right? Or infinite white, but there are a few problems with these visualizations, okay? Number one, let, let's start with the, the all black surrounding you, okay? So I, th- I think if that were to happen if in real life, like you're suspended in blackness, um, I think that would definitely be trippy kind of. But if it's all black and it's all around you, I mean, it might as well be you just closing your eyes, right? In a sense, you can close your eyes and experience infinite darkness right now. I think you would have a similar kind of concept with an infinitely uh, white space. And so that really leaves the cosmos. Like if you were suspended in the cosmos, that would definitely be an absolutely trippy kind of event, right? It's like on all sides, you look around you and you see space and galaxies and 
and stuff like that, right? And, of course, to get a sense of scale and everything, we know how giant uh, galaxies are, right? I mean, the the Milky Way alone is about 100,000 light years wide. So you would get a very profound sense of scale and scope in that kind of situation. And it really is scope and scale that is the predominant factor in infinity, at least uh, the one that I experienced and the one that I hope that we fully understand because, honestly... Again, it's that's the thing. That is the thing about infinity. And we're going to dive into that, uh, the scope and scale of it. We're going to dive into that very deeply a little later. But here's the thing. I, I just said that that is the thing, right? That isn't the only thing, though. The biggest differentiating factor between just thinking about infinity and what I saw was the presence of God. But how did I know that it was God? All I can tell you is that I just did, okay? Uh, Anytime that I've encountered his presence, uh, it's unmistakable. And uh, honestly, that's what happens a lot on psychedelics, and I know that this is a big cop-out, but when you experience certain things, you just know what they are instantly without having to question or introspect or anything like that. Bottom line, I knew it was God because I felt it. And here's another cop out for you. You you only know it unless you feel it yourself. Okay. You have to honestly take what I took, uh, the seven ounces of ayahuasca and see one of these beings and experience it to, to fully understand it. But I'm going to try to describe anyway. And once again, we have to use this concept of, of first saying what it wasn't. Okay. So first and foremost, I did not see a man on a cloud, Uh, You know, an old white man with a beard and maybe, I don't know, a lightning bolt or a trident or something like that. I did not see some personified uh, human being looking presence. I have never seen something like that when I have encountered God. So let's just throw that right out the window for any of you uh, turbocharged Christians who take the sentence, you know, we were created in God's image literally. Then I hate to disappoint you and I hate to piss you off, but that is not what I saw. The other thing that I didn't see this time, which I've actually seen before, is a somewhat humanoid-looking being, okay? There have been three instances where I've seen such a being where it either had a human face or it had the human-like appendages. In any of these cases, it always had these beautiful kaleidoscope-like symmetrical, what I would kind of loosely call wings, you could, I could see how someone could interpret them as wings, but if I didn't really, I don't know, you really had to bend your imagination to think of them as wings, but I can totally see someone thinking them as wings. Regardless, uh, I, I did not see that. There are other times that I've encountered God's presence where I see a similar kind of like kaleidoscope wing-like effect, kind of. Uh, the, the, on the periphery of this being, you can see stuff that is somewhat recognizable to something you would see in our universe. But as you get towards the center of what I'm of, of this being, th- th- there's a geometry, there's shapes and patterns and a synesthesia of everything in the center of this being that is indescribable. Like the, the, the shapes uh, at the center, you cannot draw them. You cannot mold them out of clay. You can't even draw them in a computer that has a, a hyper-dimensional space uh, built into the computer, uh, you, you know, in, in the software program or whatever. It, it, you can't imagine the shapes and, and patterns that you're looking at. I didn't even quite see that. Now, I, I kind of did, and I'll explain why later. But that th- this is another category of, of what I'm calling God that I did not see. Uh, on this experience. What I saw on this experience was this last category, an an often uh, overlooked category because it's only uh, really happened to me one other time, but it just so happened to be my first God experience. If we rewind all the way back to trip to the light, the God experience I had there was blackness. It was a void It was similar to a black hole in the sense that there was this hole there. It was, again, just just a big, uh, uh, voluminous, voluminous, I forget how to say that word, but a big freaking void. But 
the crazy thing is, unlike a black hole, which emits no light, I mean, forget about an, an accretion disk or those uh, streams of, uh, of matter that, that shoot out of quasars or whatever, um, but the actual event horizon of a black hole does not emit light. So if you caught one in empty space and it was not um, feeding on other material, right, there's just blackness there. That's it. This void that I'm calling God, even though it was black hole like in the sense that you look up and you see blackness, it still somehow radiated blinding light. It is impossible for me to describe, but all I can say is this often overused word of synesthesia. I remember in that trip trying to look up at it, at the source of all of this infinite love that was pouring onto me and almost you know, threatening to kill me, like exploding my skull with how much love and, and beauty. It's an unbelievable thing. And I, I tried to look up at it, and it was like like looking into the sun. But it was a synesthesia of love and warmth and acceptance. And just, I'm getting goosebumps right now because I say this all the time, y'all, and I really do apologize, but words cannot describe how freaking beautiful it was you can't imagine it you cannot freaking imagine how beautiful and how welcoming and how loving and that's why i look at i look at people who who say that this was a demon masquerading as a beautiful being guys there is no freaking way that a demonic entity that wishes you harm can pour this much love into you they hate people, okay? I used to not believe in demons and stuff. You better believe that I do now. And I can tell you that I can sniff that bullshit from across the universe, okay? They are trying to pull a trick on you, and I can freaking smell it. I feel it in my stomach when it happens, and it it's a disgusting, sleazy parlor trick that they're trying to pull on you. And you can you can smell it a mile away if, if you know what to look for. If you know how to sniff out trickery and someone that's trying to, you know, do the whole cloak and dagger routine on you, you know what to look for. And this infinite void, right? Now, I didn't really experience infinity on that trip, okay? But I did, uh, so like when I looked up, I didn't get quite the same feeling that I got on this last trip, uh, trip number 10, Beyond Infinity, I got kind of a watered down, filtered down, you know, turned the volume down to like three or two, right, of this experience. But that's what it is. You look up and you see blackness, but it's a blinding blackness and it hurts to look at. And it's because there's so much love. And so if you were to put a gun to me and say, what is what is the the biggest part of the whole composition of what you saw? That's what I would say is love, warmth, acceptance, but so much that it can kill you. Uh, imagine being killed by beauty and love. So what I experienced on, on this last trip, the trip number 10, was the volume turned up to its, its maximum volume, basically. You take that concept and you just go, turn up the volume. And, you know, I, I had a slight disagreement. I'm not going to call it an argument, but I had a slight disagreement with a friend of mine uh, who's religious that swore up and down. He's like, hey, you did not see God. There is no way that you that you saw God because you would be dead if you saw infinite power and infinite, you know, God's presence. You would melt, basically. I mean, just think back to uh, Indiana Jones, where they open the Ark of the Covenant and the guy's face melts off or whatever. That's that's kind of the idea. And I get it. I totally understand that sentiment. But at the same time, I know what I know. And I know what I saw and I know what I felt. And the fact that I'm not dead, maybe that means that God um, dialed the experience in such that it didn't kill me. It's like, hey... I want to show Andrew the, you know, my power and my, you know, my infinite power, but I don't want him to die. So what's the volume uh, notch here that I can turn the volume up to that doesn't kill him? Let me do that. Or 
God gave me the equivalent of a uh, submersible protective submarine, just like you would do to go down into the abyss, right? You would get crushed if you were just, you know, teleported down into the abyss. You would be crushed and killed instantly. But we get these submarines to go down there and protect us. Maybe God gave me something like that. I don't know. All I know is all I know is what I know, and what I what I know and what I saw and what I experienced was absolutely freaking mind blowing, terrifying. There is no way that it was not infinity for me. But again, going back to to what was in there, it was it started off with love. Okay, so when I when I was on that golden beach of these waves of God's love. It was the most pleasant and pleasing experience I've ever had ever in my entire life. Um, just you wanted to just go to sleep in your mom's bosom, basically. It, 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 you have a lot of those same feelings of a protective mother. Imagine, I don't know, being bullied in, in school and getting beat up one day or something like that. And you go home to your mom and she makes everything better, you know, kisses your boo-boos, you know, puts a, a neosporin on it and a Band-Aid and gives you a big hug. And I don't know, maybe you, you go to sleep in, in your mom's, you know, embrace. That is the feeling that you get, but multiplied by orders and orders and orders and orders of magnitude. And being on that golden beach and getting those waves of love washing over you, eventually that gave way, and it was through like kind of a, a dissolving through these uh, sparkles, these golden sparkles started just erupting like fireworks, and that kind of evolved. And it's hard for me to explain how it evolved, but it evolved into that that vision of the multiverse. If you recall, I, I mentioned that the, these little bubble universes were kind of immersed in this uh, ocean of gold, and it looked like kind of like a highway going up and to the left. And it was it also resembled like, like these little pods, uh, which I found out later to be little individual universes. They were stacked kind of like wheat off centered from one another and stacked going up into the left into infinity. It looked like I was on a fractal arm of one of the Mandelbrot set things. If you were to zoom in and keep zooming, you can keep zooming forever and get lost. It's infinite. That is very much the impression that I got looking at this. I instantly knew it uh, to be what, what it was, at least for me. <laughs> um, I don't know if someone else would look at it and see the same thing, for, but for, to me, it was un, un, unmis unmistakable. I was looking at a fractal spiral arm that looked like universes stacked up into infinity. And that's just one little arm, right? If you look at the Mandelbrot set, y'all, it's infinity. I was likely on the, the you know, zooming in a, a billion times on, on one of these little fractal spiral arms looking at the universes that I could just look at. But if you were to zoom out from where I was, you could probably zoom out for uh, a thousand years uh, and, and still keep seeing, seeing the same thing, the same pattern repeating. That's exactly how the Mandelbrot set is. If you're listening to this uh, episode right now on my YouTube channel, you can see right now I'm showing a, an example of zooming into the Mandelbrot set and zooming out. There's no other way to explain it other than it's infinity. But the, the most amazing thing is, is that I still had that God presence while looking in, at, at this. In fact, I got an even grander sense of God at looking at, the, looking at this infinite uh, fractal spiral arm of universes, right? The multiverse. To me, all of this was still God. That love, that acceptance, and that warmth was still very prominent and still there. But it, there was another equally... Um, intense factor or element there as well. And that there was, it started to get this element of scale and scope and, and a little bit of an introduction of cosmic terror. So, you know, ayahuasca hits you in waves. And if I remember correctly, this was like the first wave of my God experience on in this particular trip and I actually came out of that multiverse experience and, you know, in the moment, I was amazed at what I saw. I, like, I was just like, this is unbelievable. And, and by the way, there, there are things in that vision that I cannot describe. I can only t t tell you the stuff that I 
can visualize that shapes and, and stuff that are familiar enough to me in this universe that are possible enough, you know, in this universe that I can describe. There were abstract, uh, absolutely out of this universe kind of things that I saw in that moment, like geometries and the, just hyper dimensional kind of stuff that I cannot describe. Okay. The, the vision of the fi- uh, spiral fractal arm was immersed in other things um, that I cannot describe. And these other things were probably like maybe half, if not, if not like 70, 30 kind of thing of um, the, the, that's what it was. It's like 70% of something that I cannot describe. But again, all of that was still God. But regardless, in the moment, I'm looking at this in absolute awe and just, the, you know, marveling at the beauty And it wasn't until I was coming down off of that when everything kind of hit me of like, wow, what in the hell was that? And it was the reflecting back on that. It's very much like coming out of a dream. But anyway, I came out of that and it, it was not until about 20 or 30 seconds later when it started really hitting me about what I just saw. And it hit me and it was absolutely terrifying, the the fact of the reality of what I saw. And it was because what I saw was everything, absolutely everything that humans can conceivably think of. Like we have the math and, and all the science and stuff to, to come up with this concept of, of the everything that I saw. Okay. I can bring out some PhD um, theoretical physicist and he can talk about the many worlds theory and quantum mechanics where like no joke, You bust out some equations in quantum mechanics and you bust out with the many worlds theory of of an infinite amount of parallel universes. And it's one thing to go and write that out on on equations and conceptually think about that. It's another thing to see it, but not only see it, but to feel it and to know that it is God. That is so awe-inspiring and so awesome that it is terrifying. And again, when I say terrifying, I'm talking terrifying in a Lovecraftian sense, okay? H.P. Lovecraft, Cthulhu and all this stuff, where you encounter a being that is not only as old as time, like right there, just right there, that's terrifying. A being that is a billion plus years old. Just imagine encountering such a being, right? But then also something so massive that you have no... A schema in your brain to even comprehend how massive it is. It's like, it's so massive that you don't even register it as a being. In fact, you don't even register it at all. It's, it's very similar to how ants perceive us. Like, you know, it, it's evident that ants bite us, right? That they, they can perceive our, our, our presence and it's evidenced by uh, them biting us. They are somehow able to view us as a threat and they bite. But they perceive us only through the sense of smell. In the millions of years that uh, humans and our ancestors, so like humans have been around 200,000 years, right? Well, our ancestors were around for like, I forget, like 2 million years. And then you can keep going back down through the primates and everything. So we're talking millions and millions and millions and millions of years, all right? Ants have evolved alongside us. Over the course of those millions of years, they know our scent, and it's programmed basically into their uh, DNA and, and their instincts that if they smell this scent, that means danger and attack. Get that big thing, get that away from our ant bed, start biting it. A big creature gets bit by enough ants, it, it like knocks them off of its legs and it gets the hell out of there. That, that's how it works. If it picks up on these scents, it attacks, right? But if it didn't have this sense of smell... It would not even register a human being as being a being. We are too massive. We are too huge for an ant to even pick up on our existence. And you can actually see this yourself if you encounter uh, one of these less aggressive uh, ant species. Like, forget fire ants. Okay, they're assholes. Okay, I hate to... I'm trying my best not to cuss, but fire ants are assholes. But yeah, if you encounter some of these more docile ant species, you'll see it. 
you can sit right over them and even move. You can you can flail your arms around, and these ants are just going about their business, you know, not even noticing. In fact, you can kind of put your hand in in its way, and it, it barely notices. It might even come up and tap you with its, its antenna just to try to figure out, okay, what is this? And then it gets away from you, or it'll or it'll crawl on your hand, thinking it's just a, a giant twig or something that it has to crawl over. It, it would have no idea that it crawled on uh, the hand of a giant being. And in fact, even these fire ants that attack us, right, they don't know what they're attacking. They just know that they have to attack. There is no way that an ant can conceive of what we are. We are simply too huge, too massive, too tall, too everything to even register in their universe of, like, you know, bugs that are a a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller than them, you know, leaves, twigs, little little pebbles and such like that. A human is, is too massive to even enter into that little realm for them to perceive. To us, it would be like, I don't know, uh, climbing up a a really tall mountain like Mount Everest or something, not knowing that Mount Everest is alive and an actual entity and a being that, you know, can crush you if it wanted to. And by the way, that analogy of, of size difference is not that far off. I actually looked up a bunch of metrics earlier about the size difference between ants and humans. And so if we encountered a, a, a being that was proportionately larger than us, than an ant is uh, to us, we're talking about a, a being that is a mile tall and weighs uh, 45 million times more than we do. So uh, something around the, the ballpark of 9 trillion pounds, a being that can eat about a mid-sized uh, city's population of people. So like 300,000 people can fit in its stomach and it can fit a large size city like the city of Houston, right? Has 4 million people in it, right? 4 million people. So that's about how many ants can fit inside of a person. So imagine a being that can fit 4 million people inside of it. But that's not all of it. So um, yeah, imagine this being, it's a mile tall, it's uh, 9 trillion pounds, it can hold 4 million people inside of it, and it's 4,000 years old. 4,000. Okay, it it was born about the time that uh, ancient Babylon was founded. Do you kind of get where I'm coming from now when I say cosmic horror? And I'm totally beating a dead horse here, y'all, but but that is kind of the tiniest little bit of an idea of what it was like to see the immensity of what I saw in the multiverse uh, vision that I saw. That's just a taste. In reality, it was uh, orders and orders and orders of magnitude beyond that. And when I started getting hit with these waves of God's true form, these blasts of, of infinity... Which, if you recall, I, I described as uh, aurora borealis waves hitting you at like about a thousand miles per hour. But uh, corresponding with that was an even larger and more immense sense of size and scale. And to, to understand even just a little bit of how enormous it was, I, I actually created this segment on, on a previous uh, permutation or recording of this episode. This is about like my sixth time uh, recording this particular episode because it's so hard to describe infinity. But regardless, I, I recorded this whole segment where uh, we have to imagine the, the entire planet on the tip of an eyelash of a giant being. Okay. And uh, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to play that. I'm going to play that segment. Okay. It's actually really cool. I, I can't help but but play it. We're going to play it. Here we go. So imagine that you're chilling at your house one day, watching YouTube or playing video games or whatever blows your hair back. All of a sudden, you both feel and hear a low rumble. Dishes, light fixtures, and other things in your house start to rattle. And it gets more and more intense until it evolves into a full-on earthquake. Then suddenly, you feel your entire house lifting off the ground and flying into the air. You're somehow able to turn on your TV, and you're greeted with news that this is not just happening with your house. It's not localized to your neighborhood, your city, 
your state, or even your country. The entire planet seems to be violently accelerating in the direction that we call up. After two full days, the acceleration of the entire planet suddenly stops. Immediately, you think to yourself, what caused all of this? With you being an amateur astronomer and the entire world in a blackout, you seize the opportunity, grab your telescope and point it at the sky. And that's when you see the horrifying truth. You, everyone, the entire planet Earth is on the very tip of an eyelash on an unfathomably gargantuan creature that has just finished opening its eye after waking up from a four billion year power nap. And it's only a matter of time until that creature notices the tiny speck of dust on its eyelash, crushes it between its cosmically huge fingers, and flicks the flattened remains hurtling into interstellar space. So if you can kind of visualize that in your mind's eye and understand the cosmic horror of understanding that we are a speck of dust, our entire planet is a speck of dust on the eyelash of some cosmically huge being and that it, you know, just realized that we're there and is going to fling us out into the outer solar system and outer space, then you get kind of an idea of the scale of, of what I saw in these waves of God's true form, this, the, these waves of infinity, infinite power. But you don't quite get the full understanding. And here's where we start butting up against the limitations of uh, useful analogizing, okay? In order to understand the full scale, I would have to start saying ridiculous things like, imagine the entire universe is on the tip of this giant being's eyelash, okay? But even that's not big enough, okay? Because we're talking infinity here, right? So now I get even way off the deep end and had to say stuff like, imagine the entire multiverse on the tip of this giant being's eyelash. That gives you a pretty dang good idea, a really dang good idea of the scale, but not the scope. To understand the scope of what I saw, now we have to get really ridiculous. And it now analogizing kind of goes way off into La La Land. And honestly, y'all, this is the part of the podcast where... It becomes t- too abstract to, to fully grasp, okay? So I have to apologize, all right? I'm sorry. But to fully understand the scope of what I saw, now you have to imagine the, the multiverse on the tip of the eyelash of a, a hyperdimensional being, okay? Let's just imagine so- something that is 11 dimensions, okay? An 11-dimensional being, All right, now our brains are beyond the capacity for repair. Okay, we are broken. There is really no amount of speculation to understand what that's like. Kind of. And I say kind of because just like going into the abyss for the first time on an exploration mission, if you don't understand what you're, what, you know, what's down there in the abyss, you can extrapolate that which you know of what was above you. And so to start chipping away at hyper dimensions, okay, dimensions that go beyond the four dimensions that we perceive in our universe, we must try to understand what a hyper dimensional object would look like if it kind of entered into our four dimensional space. And before we start uh, griping about like, oh, I thought we were in 3D and all this other stuff, y'all, I'm talking about space time, okay, Einstein theory of relativity, it's proven that there are four dimensions. There's three of space, you know, X, Y, Z, and then there's one dimension of time. But for the sake of simplicity, I am going to refer uh, a lot to 3D because I think it's just easier for us all to uh, recognize. Uh, But 
please don't get annoyed if I jump between 3D and 4D and stuff like that. Just if you hear 3D or 4D, I'm talking about our existence, that which we perceive, uh, our universe that we understand. And so let's think of a simple object that we can interact with in these uh, hyper dimensions. Okay, so let's think of a, uh, I don't know, um, the cups are often used in my, in my podcast. So let's go with a cup, okay? Have you ever seen a one-dimensional cup? Well, if you've ever seen a straight line written on a piece of paper or on a computer screen or something like that, then the answer is yes. Any object, any object expressed in one dimension is a straight line, okay? In, w- in one dimension, there's, o- there's only two things that are possible, single points and lines. So are you seeing a straight line in your head? Okay, well, you are seeing the most beautiful and ornate cup to have ever existed in the first dimension. All right, let's take this to the next dimension. Have you ever seen a two-dimensional cup? Well, that's a very simple and easy one right there. If you've ever seen a picture or a video or anything, you know, anything on a computer screen or written down on a piece of paper or anything like that, then you've seen a two-dimensional cup. Okay, so moving on. Have you ever seen a 3D cup? Okay, well, obviously you have. We we have to drink out of cups, you know, so uh, yes, you have definitely seen a 3D cup. And not only have you seen it, you've interacted with it and you've used it to drink water. And now is where everything falls apart for us. Imagine a 4D cup. Four dimensions. Okay, so we we know of a 3D cup. I'm holding one right now, this little coffee cup that I drink my little Turkish coffee out of, right? I'm looking at this. And I'm trying to imagine an extra dimension of this cup, right? This, this cup projecting into a dimension, a direction that I can't even point towards, all right? Because we're limited to three spatial dimensions in our universe. Theoretically, there can be a, a universe with four spatial dimensions. And, and uh, being in this lower dimensional universe, that other direction, that other dimension in this 4D universe is something that I can't even point to. So taking something even as simple as a cup, if it was a four-dimensional cup, it would be so wildly inconceivable to our perception that we would not even know what we're looking at. A four-dimensional cup simply passing from four dimensions down into our three dimensions and just kind of like passing through would be utterly inconceivable to us. Higher dimensional objects passing through lower dimensions uh, show up basically as projections, uh, almost like a shadow of of what they are in the higher dimension, and and they're, it's utter, utterly uh, unrecognizable. A, a perfect example of this is the tesseract. Okay, so a tesseract is a is a four dimensional cube. So if you take a single line, like just just a line segment, right, and you pu- and you pu- kind of pull it down at a ninety degree angle from itself, right, you have now created a square. Now, if you take that square and you pull it in a 90 degree angle from where you just pulled the, that line segment, you have now created a cube. Now, if you take that cube and you pull it into a 90 degree angle that isn't even possible, like we can't even point in, in this direction of where this other 90 degree angle would be, you have created a hypercube, a tesseract. To us, it's an absolutely mind bending object, but to something in the fourth dimension, it's just a cube. Okay, and this cube, if it were to pass into our reality, y'all would be so trippy looking that you wouldn't even know what you're what the hell you're looking at. And again, if you're listening to me on YouTube, I'm playing a little video segment of what a hypercube uh, passing through three dimensions would look like. There is no way that you look at that and think, oh, that's a cube. And there's this absolutely mind-bending video uh, that Carl Sagan did. I believe it was for his uh, Cosmos uh, series that he did back in the, I think it was the early 80s or late 70s or something like that. But there's this absolutely amazing video of him explaining what uh, a two-dimensional being would experience from a three-dimensional being like popping into its reality. Let's imagine that we are perfectly flat. I mean absolutely flat. And that we live, appropriately enough, in the flatland. So he talks about wh- what a two-dimensional creature, like, a, he, it's just basically a square uh, that, that, that is alive somehow in two dimensions. What it would witness if it saw, uh, if an apple, a three-dimensional apple, were to pass through its uh, universe. 
let us imagine that into Flatland comes a strange three-dimensional creature which, oddly enough, looks like an apple. Bottom line, it would be the most trippy and bizarre thing that this little poor square ever could even conceive of. And the three-dimensional creature sees uh, an attractive, congenial-looking square, watches it enter its house, and descends to actually enter Flatland. Now, a three-dimensional creature exists in Flatland only partially. Only a plane, a cross-section through him can be seen. So when the three-dimensional creature first reaches Flatland, it's only the points of contact which can be seen. And as the apple were to descend through, slither by Flatland, we would progressively see higher and higher slices. So the square as time goes on, sees a set of objects mysteriously appear from nowhere inside a closed room and change their shape dramatically. So basically, y'all, it's the exact same concept, the exact same thing, basically, as a hypercube, a tesseract, descending into three dimensions. In the case of this Carl Sagan video, this two-dimensional square saw a two-dimensional cross-section, basically, of the apple. In our case, we would see a three-dimensional cross-section of a four-dimensional hypercube. Either way, it's crazy. Uh, we wouldn't be able to make sense of it, and we would think that we are crazy. His only conclusion could be that he's gone bonkers. But there's another part of this video that I find absolutely amazing, and, and something that corresponds so perfectly with the psychedelic experience, and that is when the apple, when it first notices the square, before it passes through in, uh, through the lower dimension or whatever, it notices the square and tries to communicate with it. And the three-dimensional creature sees uh, an attractive, congenial-looking square and decides in a gesture of interdimensional amity to say hello. Hello, says the three-dimensional creature. How are you? I am a visitor from the third dimension. Well, the poor square looks around his closed house, sees no one there, and what's more, has witnessed a greeting coming from his insides, a voice from within. He surely is getting a little worried about his sanity. I mean, y'all, to me, it's unbelievable. Th this voice is coming from a higher dimension, a higher dimension that you can't even point at. And, and because the sound is coming from that higher dimension, it would therefore be coming from everywhere in the lower dimension, including your own self. I mean, th that to me, is absolutely uh, just perfectly coinciding with the psychedelic experience, right? A voice that seems to emanate from you. Uh, the, uh, like, hello? But we're not done with this whole uh, experience yet. So there's a part in the video where uh, the apple gets, like, frustrated or something like that and knocks the poor little square up into its higher dimensions. Well, the apple might be a little annoyed at this conclusion, and so not such a friendly gesture from dimension to dimension, makes contact with the square from below and sends our flat creature fluttering and spinning above flatland. At first, the square has no idea what's happening. He's terribly confused. This is utterly outside his experience. But after a while, he comes to realize that he is seeing inside closed rooms in flatland. He is looking inside his fellow flat creatures. He is seeing Flatland from a perspective no one has ever seen it before to his knowledge. Getting into another dimension provides as an incidental benefit a kind of X-ray vision. And, and Carl Sagan kind of just casually mentions the, the fact that you get like X-ray vision when you're up in those higher dimensions. Like you can see everything, absolutely everything that is going on in the lower dimensions. And when I say everything... You can see inside of things like you, you could look inside of a person's body without opening them up. And so Carl Sagan was talking about 2D beings versus 3D beings as a helpful tool to kind of get our brains to understand y'all. But what I'm talking about is 4D beings, you know, three dimensions of space, one of time, space time. OK, four, four D beings, us, OK, interacting with. Uh, five plus dimensions, okay? If a five plus dimensional being tried to communicate with you, it would be exactly like what Carl Sagan mentions in his video. 
you would hear a voice that kind of is surrounding you, but also coming from inside of you as well. And, you know, we're already way out here in, in Speculationville, right? But this is now going to get even much more speculative. And we're going to try to think about uh, this five-plus dimensional being, its brain. So if you do not know this, let me be the first to tell you that we are absolutely limited. Us human beings are absolutely limited in how much we can perceive, number one, and also what we can think about, number two based solely on the structure of our brains. If there was another lobe in our brain or something like that, and that had evolved over uh, millions of years or, or, or whatever, we would be capable of completely different lines of thinking, and we would be uh, exponentially more intelligent as a result. And of course, that would have exponential, you know, daisy chain knockdown effects with science and technology and our society as a result would be orders upon orders upon orders of magnitude more complex as a result of that. We have to face the facts that we are the structure, the physiology of our brains limits our thinking. OK, so now take that. And imagine what the brain and the thought process, the, uh, you know, the thinking capability, the intellectual just capacity of a being that has a five-dimensional brain. It's impossible to conceive. But, but here's a start, okay? This is a very basic thing that can give you a, a tiny window into what a, a thought in five dimensions would be like, okay? So imagine, so, so in our universe, right? We have a simple binary yes or no, like, uh, you know, true or false, or if you want to think about this in circuitry, on or off, okay? But, but it's, it's just yes or no. There is no concept of maybe here because we're talking about two opposite extremes of a spectrum, okay? Yes, no, true, false, on, off. Now, I want you to think about how much of our thinking and thought and our society and our communication and religion and culture and just about everything that makes up what being a human is in terms of thinking thought and interpretation of thought and all that how much of that is based off of that simple concept of yes or no and we in our thought process and thinking is geared along those lines now i want you to imagine a scenario okay where where there's a universe somehow that exists where there is a third axiomatic polarity okay there's yes no and then there's something else it's not in between yes no it's a complete polar opposite of those two but in a completely different way that we've never we can never even conceive of you take that simple notion of there just being one more polarity and just imagine how freaking complicated everything that spills out after that fact would be Language, culture, technology, science, uh, everything that you can possibly conceive would be that much more complicated. I mean, the, the orders upon orders upon orders of magnitude more complicated. And a, a, a being with a brain in the fifth dimension would, would very easily be, I mean, it's just commonplace for them. But to us, this would be a completely foreign and alien thing that there's absolutely no way we could comprehend. And that's just scratching the surface, y'all. That's just imagining what a third polarity would be in, in, in this axiomatic uh, yes or no kind of world, okay? That's about as basic as a line of thought that you can possibly get. And so uh, piecing together this encounter with, you know, a four-dimensional being like a human, like me, right, and a five-plus dimensional being kind of uh, entering into our, uh, you know, our universe, our 4D universe... So we, we just covered earlier it talking to us, right? It, it feels like its voice is coming from within us. And because it basically has X-ray vision down into our lower dimensions, it sees everything about you. It sees everything inside of you without opening you up. And because it has such a, an incredibly complicated brain, I mean, we're talking five, five dimensions plus, right? I would bet, and I will acquiesce that, that this next part is a little bit of a stretch, um, I, I would bet that because it has such a complicated brain and it can see everything about us, that it would therefore know our thoughts, like instantly know our thoughts. Think about the absolutely insane, crazy influence that you would have over this lower dimensional being. If you could talk to it from within itself 
and know all of its thoughts. But again, that, that's just uh, communication, okay? If this being tried to enter into your four-dimensional space, you would see something utterly unrecognizable, and it would appear out of nowhere, and when it decided to peace out, it would disappear kind of out of nowhere as well. And so hopefully you're getting an idea of us kind of chipping away at the unknowable of what it might kind of be like for one of these beings to pop up and, and kind of say hi and, you know, you can see them. Okay, but but we're not done. Now this hasn't, well, I guess it did kind of happen to me with the, the, the force of evil, uh, you know, attacking me and sending me into hell and me rotting from the inside out and all that fun stuff, right? But imagine this being attacking you. And because the anatomy of a five-dimensional being would be far different than the anatomy of us, you know, uh, four-dimensional beings, uh, we can't even conceive of what an attack uh, would be like. And uh, kind of the, the only way we can even begin to comprehend what them attacking us would be like w- would be to try to understand what us attacking them would be like. You know, like, like if you tried to attack a, a five-dimensional being... That there's no way you could do it from our lower dimensions, okay? Even if you brought the biggest gun imaginable up into the fifth dimension and pointed the gun right at the quote-unquote head of one of these five-dimensional trigger uh, uh, beings and pulled the trigger, nothing would happen. The, the bullet would basically just go right through the, the being and nothing would happen, okay? It would be very similar... It, to us, if there was a two-dimensional being that had a gun that can kill other two-dimensional beings, right? Down there, it's deadly, right? But it brings it up to us, and it shoots an infinitely thin bullet into us, right? Now, th- what, what would happen if we got shot with an infin- infinitely thin bullet? Answer, nothing. Same concept applies up there, you know, up there. If we brought our four-dimensional uh, gun up there and shot it at a five-dimensional being... There's a, there's a dimension, the fifth dimension would be infinitely thin, and so this bullet would do nothing. There is a whole degree of uh, physiology that uh, any kind of weapon that, that would kill a uh, five-dimensional being would be so vastly different than something we can even conceive of that it's, it's not even worth speculating. And so, therefore, I won't. In fact, we're going we're gonna to leave weapons aside because that's even way, that's way too out there, right? Well, let's just imagine the equivalent of a punch. Now, I don't think that a five-dimensional being would have an equivalent of a punch, but just for argument's sake, let's just imagine what getting punched by a five-dimensional being would be like. So, this being comes down, it means you harm, and it decides to punch you. Very similar to that voice analogy where, uh, you know, it, it speaks to you and, and it, it, that voice it kind of gets inside of you and becomes you, basically, and emanates from you. The same thing would happen with a punch. You'd, you'd be punched and this punch would become you such that you're being hit from the inside and the outside simultaneously but, but you're being punched from the inside out, and every single cell, every single atom in your body is that punch. And, and every single little subatomic particle in your body punches itself from the inside out, but also the outside in. I don't know about you, but that sounds absolutely devastating. And I just want to make it very clear, I'm not saying that I got punched <laughs> by, by a five-dimensional being or something. Uh, all of this is coming to a point, I promise, and, and the point is basically what I saw was the equivalent of a hyperdimensional, I don't know how many dimensions above me, uh, no clue, I just know that it was something hyperdimensional, and it was a being, and there was something hyperdimensional going on with this being and uh, other things, right? And so we're going to table this concept of a five-dimensional punch, uh, basically violence in the, in the fifth dimension and beyond. We're going to table that for a second, and we're going to talk about the other things, quote-unquote, that I just mentioned that, that I saw in there. So within this absolutely indescribably massive uh, hyper-dimensional experience, uh, of which I feel the overwhelming presence of God within it, encompassed in that same synesthesia was just like I've said on a lot of different experiences where 
you get this feeling of infinite emotion and like an infinite amount of different emotions and an infinite degree of it. I've said this before, but it's every emotion. It's love and happiness and joy and elation. Is it elatement or elation? I, I can never get that one right. But um, then you get fear, sadness, um, anger, um, all, all the negative uh, sorrow, um, all of this, the negative emotions as well, all wrapped up into this super emotion and, that, and it's an infinite amount of it that's getting blasted into, blasted into your skull. But that's not all that was in there. Within that same synesthesia of all of this, there was what I can only amount to knowledge. And I know that's a very, very bizarre concept, but it, it, you're, I was looking at the, the multiverse, and then the multiverse uh, evolved into this thing, this multidimensional thing with God involved uh, that, that was indescribable. You can't, there's no schema in, in, like I said, there's no schema in my brain or anyone's brain to understand what it was. But in the moment, you kind of did. I know that's very weird to say, but uh, it's, I could piece it together and understand kind of, I'm not saying all of it. I don't dare have the balls to say that I understood all of it, but I understood a good deal of it and much more than I understand now. Um, it's as if my soul understood what was going on. And I know that is a giant cop out y'all, but I swear, I swear to you, it's true. I was looking and perceiving and taking in the synesthesia and it just made sense. Now it's not like you could give me, um, a a pen and paper and ask me to write out the, um, the, you know, the theory of everything in an equation or something in that moment. And then I could do it. Like, forget it. That's impossible. It's uh, everything I was seeing and experiencing was way too abstract. And, and, and even immediately coming after that, uh, you know, out of that experience, if someone was like, tell me exactly what you saw and what you comprehended, I, I can't, I can't, there's no way I could do it, but I'm telling you, I don't know how else to describe it. Hopefully there are some other people out here who have had the same experience. I've seen one video of someone that said that, that they had this uh, similar experience, and they said that their spirit understood. And there's light coming off him. So we had a conversation, we talked, and he started talking to me about spiritual things. He started talking about the foundations of the earth, started talking about the, the heavens and the earth, chambers of the heavens and the celestial bodies. Uh, my spirit knew about these concepts, but I guess... I, 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 I f- my spirit knew about this concept, but it was it was hard to follow along because there was so much information and so much detail to what he was saying. So it was very overwhelming. Um, the, we're, I'm just using a different word, okay? My soul, whether you want to call it a soul or a spirit, I understood what was going on, kind of, a lot better than I do now. And so, yeah, it's it's infinite emotion, infinite knowledge uh, of which I am understanding a tiny bit. And uh, but that tiny bit is just unbelievably like, wow, kind of thing. But, you know, that was just kind of the second wave. It was really the third and the fourth waves where I encountered uh, what I call this this cosmic warfare. Okay, and that's where we get back into the violence, uh, like this whole concept of being punched from a a five-dimensional being. All right, so let's take that analogy a little further now. Let's imagine that two five-dimensional beings showed up, all right, and started punching each other. Again, uh, these five-dimensional beings, you cannot pick up on any kind of form from them, you, like, but you do pick up on a presence. Like, you know that they're beings, but they're, it's so utterly unrecognizable kind of what you're seeing. But all you see is you see two things that you can't describe, right? And, and they're doing something to each other that you also can't describe. They're punching each other, but in, in a fifth dimensional context, and you can't make sense of it looking at a, a four dimensional projection. Okay. But here's one thing that I guarantee you, you would understand about what you were witnessing. I believe a hundred billion quadrillion quintillion percent that you would recognize this for what it truly is, which is violence. And I have no explanation about how you would understand it as violence other than to say that if, if you, there was an ant crawling around the ground that did not even perceive you because you were so big, but you took your fist and slammed it down as hard as you can right next to the ant, 
I, and, and surely some of you have done this before. What happens with the ant? It starts taking off running. It knows something bad is going on, right? And it's getting the hell out of there regardless. And that is exactly what I experienced in waves three and four of God's true form, the, the, these waves of infinity. What I experienced was cosmic violence. And again, I understood that it was violence for two reasons. I mean, even though it was so abstract that you can cannot even begin to comprehend what you're looking at, at the same time, it was so intense, it was very much like someone slamming their hand on the ground next to an ant. Like, it was very clear, like, this is something to be absolutely terrified of. And the other reason I knew it is going back to that whole concept of my soul just understanding. Like, for whatever reason, this information, this knowledge of what it was, it was just in me, and I knew. And honestly, this is something that I've seen uh, two other times on my experiences. Um, and the, the, the two other times that I saw it, though, it was just a tiny little peek. It was, it was like peeling the curtain back behind uh, the reality to see the cosmic uh, spiritual warfare that's going on behind the scenes. But, uh, but again, th those first two times was just a peak. This was a full immersion. This was like, grab me by the back of the you know, head and dunk me in, <laughs> you know, uh, drown me in this cosmic war. And, and so, yeah, j just to be clear, uh, you know, I, I said violence earlier. It, it wasn't just violence. Okay. It, this was full on warfare the most epic and terrifying that you can possibly imagine. And quite literally, y'all, the only word that I can even think of to begin to describe it is cosmic. To boil it down in the simplest terms that I can possibly think of, okay? Uh, think of the, 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 the good and the evil that we experience in, in our existence, you know, this planet, this universe or whatever. Think of what we can experience as good and evil here as being just the tip of the iceberg. The rest of these icebergs, like 90% of them, stretch into cosmic territory. Like going back to the thought of higher dimensional thinking and, and how a, a five dimensional or five plus dimensional brain can be absolutely complex just around the concept of a, a third uh, axiomatic polarity, uh, like yes, no, and something else. That is absolutely alien and foreign and absolutely abstract. We, we can never, we can't even conceive of something like that. And again, that's just the simplest of simple things. But if we if we ex extract and uh, extrapolate that uh, analogy to to both the, the the iceberg of good and evil that stretch into the cosmic realms, what I'm saying here is there are hyperdimensional cosmic aspects to both good and evil that we will never understand and never comprehend. There are motives and there are things going on beyond our little tiny sliver of reality that we have evolved to perceive. There are things going on beyond that in both areas that is absolutely freaking mind-blowingly unbelievable. You, we cannot and will not understand ever. But one thing that I did certainly understand was that it was, in fact, warfare and that it was also the most serious thing you can possibly imagine. And y'all, I can't think of another word th th than serious. I mean, I guess I could throw out like dire and, and grave or something like that. But really, it was the most extreme uh, seriousness that you could possibly imagine. And of course, it has to be, because after all, we're talking about freaking God going to war with evil in a cosmic, multi-dimensional, uh, infinite way. And it was so freaking intense that it almost killed me again. I mean, if you were, this is the part where I had to either vomit uh, crap or, or piss myself, and I chose to piss myself. And, and that's the only thing, uh, aside from looking at the crucifix and, 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 you know, basically Jesus helping me through all of this, those are the only things that saved me. Y'all, it was just like having a freaking ant, and I know I'm going back to this ant analogy again, y'all, but ants actually go to war. They have a conception of warfare, and the totality of their warfare 
consists of them walking around with their legs, right, and then using their mandibles to to rip other um, the you know ants' legs off and other and antenna and other things like that. Now some ants have stingers. Others can like shoot like little kind of like acid at other ants or whatever. But we're gonna stick with with just the mandibles, okay? So the extent of uh, uh, ant warfare is mandibles and and legs. Imagine dropping an ant with its absolutely primitive knowledge of what it thinks warfare is into the most epic battle in human history. Imagine dropping that ant into the battle of freaking Stalingrad. Okay, there were two million casualties in the Battle of Stalingrad. Okay, we're talking, uh, uh, you know, shootouts and, and uh, you know, between thousands of troops. Okay, and that's just the gun part, right? They're shooting their guns. They're also throwing grenades. Okay, now just think about just a gunshot, what that would be like. It, it, you're an ant and you're next to someone shooting a gun. The the compression wave from that, uh, you know, from that shock wave from the bullet that that's that's freaking crazy but now thinking think about a, a, a grenade landing in the room and, and you're an ant and a grenade lands in there think about how epically freaking it's impossible to if, to understand the dis- disparity between the ant in that situation and the power of that grenade and that's just grenades y'all there were freaking tanks w- that were shooting these giant freaking uh, tank cannons all over the place and exploding buildings around a- everywhere and then you got aircraft coming in and dropping like giant freaking uh, 400 pound bombs i, I mean y'all the- the- it is impossible for an ant to comprehend what in the hell is going on all it knows is mandibles and and going up and basically biting another ant. An ant caught up in all of this would not know what the hell is going on, but I guarantee you it would know at least one thing, that whatever was happening was gravely serious, as serious as war, because it is war. Now, that was about as good as an ending as I can put on this. That last statement there was a very powerful statement. Best to just kind of leave that as is. But the reality is, of course, that that doesn't even come close to the understanding of what witnessing the cosmic warfare going on between God and evil was really like. The disparity between scale and scope, y'all, is irreconcilable. Anything that we can conceive of compared to infinity is infinitely smaller than infinity. But I have to stop with that explanation right there because I could keep analyzing this and keep diving in uh, to the abyss trying to explain, and I will be chasing my tail ad infinitum. So we have to leave that as is for now. And I say for now because we are not done exploring what was inside of those waves of God's true form. The blasts of infinity. There is another component to these waves that is just as massive in scope and scale as the cosmic warfare that I saw. And the implications of its meaning could very well be more terrifying than the cosmic war itself. All that and much more we are going to cover in part two. And I promise there will be a resolution, a relief from the cliffhanger that we had at the beginning of the episode where I'm in Italy and something's going on on my table that is of cosmic significance, okay? I am not going to let that one just dangle unresolved. There will also be, you know, because what is a uh, Pantheos episode without uh, synchronicities, there will be three or so unbelievably hair-raising synchronicities that, again, just validate all of this for me. So with that being said, I will see you all in about two weeks or so. Um, I'm going to try to release the the next one pretty soon. But anyways, be looking forward to it. Don't miss it, because again, you're not going to have a full understanding of God's infinite power and, and, and appreciate it too, unless you listen to part two. And then once you have that knowledge, we can thereafter start diving into these other 
uh, unbelievably deep concepts, uh, guys. The, the, the content that I have coming up is so freaking deep, you, you have no idea. I mean, I, I think you do have a little bit idea. Uh, you, you heard the, the, the last episode, for crying out loud, okay? But we're going to dive deeper into those concepts, because I can, and I want to, and I think we will all be better for it. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing, after all. So I will see you all soon, and I love you all, and uh, yeah, just uh, keep journeying. Love you. Bye.